Good morning. I convene the House Education Finance Committee today. Um, with that, or I should say, for April 9th, with that, um, Representative Jordan or Representative Purcell, you had a chance to the minutes? <laughs> yes, Madam Chair. I have reviewed the minutes and I would move their approval. <laughs> Thank you. Representative um, Jordan has looked at the minutes for April 4th. Are there any questions on the minutes, folks? Um, I'll renew Representative Jordan's motion to uh, approve the minutes. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The minutes for April 4th are adopted. With that, members, just a reminder, we're going to have to leave at about 11.45 today for people to get over to the floor. So I'll quick make this announcement now. We will not be meeting Wednesday morning, of course, because we'll be on break, but we will also, or Thursday morning, we'll come back here on Monday, April 15th with a change in schedule. So Monday, April 15th, we're here at 1 o'clock in room 200 to walk through the education finance bill. On the 16th and 17th, we'll be back in this room at our normal time. On the 16th, we'll be taking testimony. And on the 17th, we will be taking amendments and voting the bill out. So that's just a preview for next week in case we run out of time. And uh, our wonderful CA, Mr. Fennick, will send calendar invites to the members just to remind you guys with the change in schedule. With that, we'll move to our first item on the agenda, House File 4232 with Representative Senator Mara. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So um, for House File 4232, I believe that you have the A2 amendment. Do you want me to discuss the bill first and um, then move the amendment, or how would you like to do it? Thank you, Representative Senator Mara. Why don't we go ahead and have you move the bill before the committee for possible inclusion in education finance bill. Is that your motion? Yes. Thank you, um, Representative Senator Murrah, and welcome to your own committee. Uh, with that, I think what we'll do is we will have you provide, um, lay out the bill and provide testimony, and then we'll go to the amendment. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, House Bill 4232 uh, addresses compensatory revenue. So compensatory revenue is funding provided to school districts based on the number and concentration of students from low income families in each school building. As many on this committee will remember, in the 2023 education budget bill, we included language that ensured that compensatory revenue would not decrease below its 2024 amount if the passage of universal meals led to a decrease in the number of families who completed income eligibility forms. And the hold harmless passed in that bill extended only until fiscal year 27. We just received um, recent data from MDE that shows us that there has not been any dip in compensatory rate aid revenue and the forecast estimates that total statewide compensatory revenue will actually be higher than the floor that is set in statute. So that has a little bit changed kind of the purpose of this bill. This means that districts will be receiving even more money through compensatory revenue funding than they were anticipating. Um, so this bill, uh, I think the portion of it that really matters now, given um, the new data that we have, uh, is at the end of the bill, um, line 2.18 on, um, which uh, pushes the um, uh, hold harmless on the revenue uh, and it adds and later. So going beyond 2027 uh, to ensure that if um, our uh, compensatory revenue does dip below, that the funding will be reallocated, even though we don't anticipate that for the next few fiscal years. Uh, this is really, you know, there needs to be further conversation, and I think stakeholders are committed to having those uh, conversations. And I know that some members are working on kind of broader conversations about compensatory revenue, but to uh, ensure that we have um, some uh, commitment to our school districts about not dipping below, I think that this this bill is still important, uh, and would love to bring up some testifiers who can speak more to it. Thank you so much. With that, we have your first testifier remotely, Dr. Steve Yunowski, Superintendent of Richfield Public Schools. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Sure. Dr. Steve Yunowski, Superintendent of Richfield Public Schools. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. I have a management team meeting, so I am required to be in Richfield, but I would have preferred to be there. Now, Richfield is a first-tier suburb. We are very diverse and very uh, proud of the diversity within our school district. Back before COVID, we had between 62 and 64 percent free and reduced lunch students. Um, over the next two years, when we provided free meals to our community, we actually dropped to about 50 percent. So a 
12 to 14 percent drop in our free and reduced count, um, which actually reduced our comp ed formula by over a million dollars per, per year. Uh, that caused us to make some really challenging reductions to some of the services that comp ed provides to our students. Uh, the year after, um, when we had our one year um, where we actually were charging for lunches again, our free and reduced count jumped right back up into the low 60s. Uh, this current year, we're looking at a 57% free and reduced lunch count, and we're very appreciative of the legislature for looking after our funding for comp ed so we don't have to make some very challenging choices in regard to math supports, reading supports, and those social, emotional, mental health supports that all of our students need. We do anticipate another 5 to 7% drop next year in free and reduced count. Um, it is very challenging for some of our families to fill out those forms. And, and we are also very proud of the fact that we are providing free food to all of our students. We just want to urge the legislature to continue monitoring data. We do think this is an important bill. And we also want to make sure that we don't just take one year data and jump too quickly. Um, there could be longer term impacts because we actually saw the change over a couple of years. So we appreciate the floor. And we really urge the committee to continue forward and look for long-term fixes, um, not short-term fixes. And then one last thing for us to also monitor, we actually in Title I funds from a federal perspective uh, did see a reduction due to the reduction in our free and reduced counts. Um, and so we also do want the committee to be aware that federal funds tied to Title I and other areas are also impacted this, by this. Um, and so we wa really want us to all uh, take that time with the data both short term and long term to make sure that we aren't inadvertently making decisions um, that negatively impact our students. Thank you for the opportunity to talk today. Thank you so much, um, Superintendent mm -hmm. Unowski. Next up, we have Tim Burkholder, Director of Business. Sorry? Tina. Sorry, Tina Burkholder, Director of Business Services, Monticello School District. Please say your name properly for the record and proceed. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Tina Burkholder, and I'm the Director of Business Services at Monticello Public Schools and the Legislative Committee Chair for the Minnesota Association of School Business Officials. Okay. All right. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. To add what was already discussed, <clears throat> new for the 22-23 school year, MDE selected to participate in the U.S. Department of Agricultural, or USDA, demonstration project to evaluate direct certification with Medicaid. With this program, there are additional ways by which eligible students can be certified for free and reduced meal benefits without completing an application for educational benefits. This change generated additional compensatory revenue for school districts as more students qualified for the meal benefits. With the Minnesota Free Meals Program approved last year, how compensatory revenue was calculated changed too. Compensatory revenue for FY24 is calculated under the current law, which includes students or families um, completing the meal benefit application forms and was adjusted with the increase in the basic revenue allowance. For FY25, compensatory revenue will be calculated similarly, but subject to a hold harmless to FY24 to avoid a potential revenue loss due to fewer families submitting free and reduced price meal benefit applications because of receiving free meals, there might be less likelihood that families are completing the meal benefit applications. For FY26 and later, only the directly certified eligible students will generate <laughs> compensatory revenue. This is concerning to school finance personnel as it was also announced starting April 1st, 2023, that income le limits are changing for Medicaid eligibility. Therefore, school districts might see a decrease in students qualifying qualifying under the Medicaid program. Even with the Minnesota Free Meals program, there are some schools that are seeing an increase in families completing the meal benefit application. So regards to the future calculation of compensatory revenue, I ask and support that the hold harmless continue beyond FY25 to gather more information regarding the trends of students eligible under Medicaid program and those that are completing the meal benefit application so we can better understand the effects to school districts. Uh, thank you for your time and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Director Burkholder. Um, next, I think we will go to the, um, <clears throat> oh, sorry, there's no members of the public, of the public that have test, signed up to testify for House File 432. <coughs> With that, I think we'll go, if you're okay, um, Representative Senator Murray, if we go to the A2 amendment. Thank you, members. I'm just going to offer this amendment and briefly explain it. 
I've already talked to Representative Senator Murr about it. Last year, we worked to make sure our districts did not lose compensatory aid money during this interaction with Universal Meals and Direct Cert. And as you've heard from the testifiers, it's important for us to keep looking at those that data as we move forward to see how those numbers play out. Um, in the language of our bill last year, we took the governor's hold harmless language for 26-27. There was a chapter law in place that was inadvertently left off uh, when MMB looked at the language for the February forecast. This chapter law was put in place for seven school districts with larger buildings that would have been adversely affected by a previous formula change. Uh, this amendment would simply put the money back into the 2026-2027 fiscal years that the school districts were expecting. The cost is $7.325 million per year and was negotiated to be in our TAILS target. I ask for your support for this amendment. Um, Representative Senator Murray, any comments on the amendment? No, I take that as a friendly amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any questions on the amendment? Seeing none, with that, all those in favor of the A2, please say yeah. aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The A2 amendment is adopted. With that, members, we will go to the table for questions on the, under, the bill as amended. Seeing none, final comments, Representative Senator Murrah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee members. You know, I think uh, ensuring that we, as we move to new and better systems and try to make sure that we are, um, you know, changing our funding structures to really reflect the needs of the school buildings. I think it's also important for schools to have uh, stability and, and a commitment about the levels of funding that they will get. And so this bill works to do that. I look forward to continued uh, conversations um, with MDE and stakeholders uh, about changes that we might need to make to this moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Burra. And this is something we're gonna keep our eye on too as well. Um, with that, members, uh, House File 430, 4332 is laid over as amended for a possible inclusion in education finance bill. Um, next up, we have House File 5004, Representative Tapke. Thank you, Representative Kat Tap, you welcome back to the Education Finance Committee. With that, I will move your House File 4232 before the committee. 5004. 5004. Got to flip the page over. 5004 <laughs> before us um, for um, to lay over on the table, but we want to have the dis to lay over. Sorry. It has been a morning already. So let's start over again. I will move House File 5004 before the committee for discussion with the with the intention to lay it over. Thank you. Now with that, Representative Tapke, would you like to start your testimony? Thank you very much, uh, Chair Joachim. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to have this conversation. So uh, uh, this is my, our school district, Shakopee School District is right on the cusp of two different major funding programs uh, that are significantly detrimental to our uh, district for n not receiving those. So we're right on the edge of being able to receive both QCOMP and long-term facility maintenance. And so what uh, this is, is starting the conversation. Uh, if uh, this year we're able to get something done with it, I would absolutely love that. That would be really great for our district and helping to make sure that uh, class sizes stay reasonable, that we're able to offer activities the way we uh, need to and that we're able to uh, maintain our facilities the way that's necessary as well. And so uh, with that, the QCOMP program, um, <coughs> Jacobie is again, like I said, right on the edge of that, being eligible for that program. And that would be 1.9 million in funding for our district and then uh, long-term facilities maintenance that would be 1.4 million so a total of 3.3 between two programs that we are just on the edge of and so we wanted to talk today about uh, how this uh, specifically would impact our school district by having this funding available for our folks and then also have a conversation about the greater statewide uh, size of things and making sure that we um, are looking at this on a holistic uh, approach and making sure that we're looking at the best uh, interest of school districts for across the state. And so um, to discuss these uh, two different programs, we have two testifiers. Madam Chair, we also have just, if there are questions, the uh, superintendent of Shakopee Schools and assistant superintendent are here as well if there are further questions for uh, uh, that. Thank you, Representative Tapke, and I want to thank you for bringing this forward. And I think I'm going to pitch it to nonpartisan staff first to have Mr. Strom kind of explain what the alternative teacher um, um, compensation model looks like and just a brief explanation. Thank you, Mr. Strom. Madam Chair, members, there's a couple of printouts in your packet today. There's a single sheet that shows the QCOMP waiting list 
this program is known as a statutory name, Alternative Teacher Comp uh, uh, Compensation Program, but really goes by, by QComp. And districts develop a plan uh, uh, for different ways to modify uh, uh, teacher pay and teacher rewards and uh, teacher training opportunities. And so for the 110 uh, districts and charter schools in the program, there's a whole variety of models uh, that they use for QComP revenue. The revenue is a fixed amount uh, keying off a number in statute for the basic aid. And since that amount hasn't been uh, substantially changed in the last several years, there's a significant waiting list. The single page document in your packet shows that as of the end of 2022, there was uh, 27 districts and charter schools on the waiting list. And if additional funding were to be provided, my guess is the waiting list would start to grow again. Uh, for the former expansions of the list, the department has simply gone down in order on the waiting lists, and you can see uh, how the districts and charters look on that waiting list in front of you. The QComP revenue totals $260 per pupil for school districts. It's a mix of aid and levy, and the column on the right side of that labeled potential QComP revenue uh, would show the impact if all 27 districts on the waiting list were funded. Thank you, Mr. Strom. With that, we'll go to the testifiers. Um, first up, we have, um, sorry, first up, we have Dale Anderson, president of Shakopee Education Association. Please, once you get settled, state your name for the record and proceed. Chair Yuakim, respected members of the committee. My name is Dale Anderson. I'm the president of uh, Shakopee Education Association and a social studies teacher in the district. I'm here to testify on behalf of House File 5004. Thank you for giving me a few minutes to speak on behalf of this legislation today. Please allow me to begin with a little history of Shakopee's engagement for, with, with QComp. Shakopee has pondered participating in QComp since the program's inception, but for a variety of reasons, it didn't become a priority until the teacher development and evaluation law was in development. At that point, it became clear to us and a number of other districts that without QComP funds, the district's efforts to comply with TDE would become another unfunded mandate by the state. As a result, in 2016, the SEA and district did extensive work together to develop and refine a QComP plan. Over the course of a little over a year, we researched, planned, wrote, submitted, received feedback, rewrote, resubmitted, received more feedback, refined again, and finally received approval for our QComP plan from MDE. And then, to our deep disappointment, the 2017 Minnesota Legislature chose not to include the expansion of QComP funding in the budget for the 2017-2019 biennium. So Shakopee and nearly 30 other districts who have MDE-approved QComP plans were left out. We are now at the point it's been seven years, and we're still waiting to be included. Mm -hmm. I would contend that this inequity happened at the very time when our state began to feel the effects of the teacher shortage due to the combination of increasing teacher work expectations and pay disparity teachers experience compared to other professionals with similar credentials. Frankly, we as a society have never expected more from our teachers as they work to positively impact student learning in a complex, rapidly changing world. And yet we've increased these expectations at the same time we've collectively chosen to pay them 28% less than other professionals with the same levels of education in Minnesota, according to the Star Tribune article, how well are Minnesota teachers paid from March 15th of this year. Additionally, the vast majority of districts across the state, including Shakopee Public Schools, find themselves scrambling to manage their annual costs to function. In just the past four years alone, inflation has risen more than 20%, according to the U.S. Inflation Calculator, 7% in 21, 6.5% in 22, 3.4% in 23, and currently 3.2% in 24. This is at the same time the state has provided about 10% additional funding on the general aid formula, 2%, 2%, 4%, and 2%. While that 4% in year one of this current biennium is more than the schools have seen in a long time, the combined total from the last four years doesn't even cover half the inflation costs for running a school. Currently, Shakopee is trying to compete with its neighbor districts in the southwest metro area regarding teacher pay and benefits so that we can recruit and retain highly effective teachers. But we have several significant economic disadvantages. One, nine of the 11 districts uh, from the southwest metro have higher annual operating levies to the degree that Shakopee receives an average of $3.8 million less in annual, re in annual revenue. And two, all 11 of our neighbors receive QCOM funding that for a district our size adds up to almost $2 million more revenue annually. That's almost $6 million less in funding every single year. How can we compete? 
Clearly, this legislation does not address all of the inequities in school funding, but this bill does address one funding source not currently available to Shockley Public Schools. In terms of fairness and equity, we're simply asking for, for the same full Q count funding that so many others currently use. Such funding would help support professional learning, make a dent in the wage, and make a dent in the wage gap we experience, and ultimately will help foster increased student academic achievement. In closing, we want to remind the honorable members of this committee of the significant efforts we've already made to create a plan that meets the state's expectations for QCOMP, as well as to remind the committee of the deep disparity and flat out inequality that exists from the state's current decision to fund some local QCOMP plans, but, but not others, when we all live under the same legal obligations. Fixing this flaw is the right thing to do, rather than requiring the taxpayers of some districts to pay for TDE lo locally, where others receive direct aid from the state for the same purpose. Finally, we in Shakopee are thankful for the legislature's work this last session that began making a dent in the underfunding in public schools that's been going on for decades. We appreciate those efforts and hope to see continued progress on these issues moving forward. Thank you for allowing me the time to testify. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much, President Anderson. With that, we have next up, we have Annie Heiss, instructional coach from Bluffview Elementary. Once you get settled, please state your name for the record and proceed. Chair Yukim and members of the House Education Finance Committee, my name is Amy Heisey. I'm an instructional coach at Lake City Public Schools. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak in support of House Bill 5004. Um, in my position as an instructional coach, I'm in the front lines every day supporting teachers as they learn new teaching strategies to ensure a strong education foundation for students. Uh, most recently, I've led the adoption of a brand new reading program reading curriculum and I'm preparing to guide teachers through the science of reading training that's part of the READ Act uh, passed last year. Um, as a classroom teacher of 25 years and now an instructional coach, I see how extremely valuable professional development and coaching can be for teachers, which can positively impact student success. House Bill 5004 supports the expansion of funding for the QCOMP program facilitated by the Minnesota Department of Education. QCOMP was created to provide additional funding for districts to be used on professional development and additional teacher pay. Lake City Schools saw the value of this program and applied nearly eight years ago. Due to lack of funding, we've been on that waiting list ever since. Our neighboring districts in rural southeastern Minnesota are part of the 109 or 110 districts who have approved QCOMP applications and have been receiving this funding for many years causing a funding, funding inequity for Lake City students. Our ask is simple, fund the QCOMP program to allow the 25 schools on the waiting list to access these critical funds in a time where teacher professional development in reading has become our statewide priority. For Lake City schools, this would mean an additional $301,000 annually. I love my job. I get to help teachers be better at what they do and tell them what they're great at every day. Recently, I was able to assist a kindergarten teacher in analyzing reading data, making small, impactful changes to his instruction to ensure all students would be proficient in their letter sounds by the end of the year. Checking in with him monthly and seeing the growth of his students is something valuable to him. But more importantly, it means those kindergartners will have a solid foundation for learning to read. I work at our K-6 building in Lake City. Our high school doesn't have an instructional coach, and I hear every day from high school colleagues frequently about how much they would appreciate to have a coach at their level as well. QCOMP can help our district provide the much needed resources for our staff and pay that is competitive with our neighboring districts. Lake City District is committed to providing high quality professional development for our staff and the best compensation package our budget will allow. By supporting House Bill 5004, you will ensure districts and others like us around the state have a fair funding opportunity, giving our students the very best education possible. Thank you, Chair Yuakim and members of the House Committee for your time and support of this legislation. Thank you, Instructional Coach Heisey, for your testimony. With that, members will go to the table for questions or comments. Um, Represent, oh, we'll leave Kusha, we'll put you at the end. Um, Represent Hill. Thank you, Chair Yuakim, and thank you, Representative Tapke, for bringing this important bill. I wanted to just briefly um, 
celebrate the QCOMP program and uh, the benefits of it. It's a, it's a worthy investment for our state that has um, direct impacts on student learning. Um, in my experience, um, as someone who was at the table designing a QCOMP plan years ago, um, there are opportunities here, and these opportunities are widespread. The opportunities for partnerships, the opportunities for the building of empathy between staff members and administrative colleagues and school boards, and opportunities like the important ones that Ms. Heise provides to our colleagues. Uh, that job embedded professional development is uh, the greatest impact uh, that uh, I've seen, that I've experienced in my career, and I can't say enough good things about QCOMP. And so thank you for bringing this important bill. Thank you, Representative Hill. Um, with that, Representative Bigberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Representative Tabke. Uh, and I would echo what uh, Vice Chair Hill talked about as well, and, and, and the power that can happen really twofold that I've seen through this. The, the first, and it was on display here, uh, we had Mr. Anderson, who's the, the head of the Shakopee Teachers Union, and he talked about the partnership in developing the QCOMP plan um, with the, the district. And it sounds like Representative Hill was part of that uh, in his district, one of my previous districts, I had the opportunity to be uh, part of that. And, and really, that's a common theme that we see at the local school district level where, uh, where you know, the, the union and, and administration are working together to do what's in the best interest of, of the community and ultimately the kids in the community. So uh, I would just say thank you. Uh, well done, Shakopee. Well done. Uh, to other districts and um, anything that we can do to help grow uh, the education profession and support our, our professionals that are working with kids uh, is a worthy endeavor. So thank you. Thank you. Any other members before I go to Rep uh, Lee Krisha? Oh, Representative Rennick. Uh, yes, Th thank you for bringing this forward. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up LTFM, right? Fixing the flaw. I think, uh, I, though I disagree about going at it one district at a time, I would love to see all of the districts included, whether that's 197, International Falls, St. Peter, Richfield. So I just felt like I, I, you know, go roofs, right? So any opportunities. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Vernig. With that, I think I'll go to Lead Krisha. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Tapke, for your bill, and thank you to the testifier. Uh, just two quick questions, and uh, Mr. Anderson, you can either nod your head or if, if uh, Representative Tapke can answer them. Have you settled your contracts for the year, and are you project is Shakopee projecting cuts for next year? Representative Tapke. Uh, the answer to the first part of that question is no, and the answer to the second part of that question, I am not uh, entirely sure. So I don't know if we want Superintendent Redmond or uh, the uh, the answer is no. We have the second part as well. So so no and no. Correct. Thank you. And we just passed a an operating levy a couple years ago. We had uh, massive cuts in the Shakopee School District <laughs> in twenty. 20 maybe I forget exactly what the year was 2019 um, and uh, so there were uh, really big cuts and that we the community supported the teachers and it was wonderful and we got the uh, operating levy but it doesn't get us where we need to be yet no I would leave to any other comments uh, with that I was happy closing comments uh, thank you very much chair Joachim for uh, letting us uh, bring this forward and talk about these really important topics that uh, are in incredibly important to uh, my district, but also districts, as Representative Verdict said, talked about across the state. These are things that we need to continue to work on and uh, continue to finance. Thank you to Representative Bagberg for uh, his uh, support of this bill and the work on its behalf. And so I just appreciate everyone uh, having a good discussion about this, and hopefully we can continue to work on this as it goes into the future. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Representative Tapke. With that, we'll uh, lay, renew my motion to lay over House File 5004. And I will move to um, the testifier table for the next bill and give the gavel over to Vice Chair Hardy.
So our next bill on the agenda is House File 5326. Chair Joachim, would you like to move House File 5326 before the committee with the intention to lay it over for possible inclusion in the Ed Finance Bill? Yes, Chair Clardy, that's my motion. You may present your bill. Thank you, Chair Clardy. With that, good morning, Chair Clardy and members. Thank you for hearing House File 5326. 26 today, it's a late comer but a goodie. Um, last session we invested in universal meals in our schools. It has been a success and has more of our students eating breakfast and lunch in our cafeterias across the state. With this increase of students, districts have been asking for flexibility in their use of their school food service accounts. Chair Kunish in the Senate crafted this legislation to provide some of that flexibility after speaking with some districts. It adds lunchroom furniture to items that can be purchased out of the school district, out of the district school food service account if they have a surplus in that fund for over three consecutive years. You know, members, I think this is an important conversation to start now with some flexibility, but once our schools have another year of universal meals under their belts, we'll be able to revisit how this, these surplus funds can be spent and uh, for, further utilized. So this is just the beginning of the conversation. With that, I have a few testifiers here today. Wonderful, thank you, Chair Joachim. Um, our first testifier is Mandy Fletcher, Superintendent of Blue Earth Area Schools. Good morning and thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Joachim, for introducing House File 5326 and allowing me to speak today. I am Mandy Fletcher, Superintendent of Blue Earth Area Schools. I'm here today to speak to this bill, which is the result of a conversation I had with Senator Kunish. A couple weeks ago, I had the pleasure of meeting with elected officials to discuss some important topics as it pertains to schools and financing. One of the items I shared was our increasing fund balance in our food service fund. Historically, it has been the hope of the Minnesota Department of Education that schools carry no more than three months worth of expenses in this fund to encourage investing in the food service program and kitchen equipment. Since the pandemic created unusual circumstances that resulted in higher reimbursement rates for school meals, many schools, including Blue Earth Area, saw larger increases in their food service fund. As such, MDE increased their allowable amount in this fund to six months worth of expenses before schools need to submit a spend down plan. The challenge for schools to spend down this fund balance comes due to the restrictions on what can be purchased using dollars from the food service fund. Under current state statute, schools are not able to purchase cafeteria tables using food service funds, for example. For Blue Earth Area, we have historically had a healthy food service fund balance, but in the last few years, it has grown even healthier to approximately 2.5 times the amount of our historical average, which is great news. But again, the challenge to spend it down becomes greater when there are so many restrictions on what this fund can be spent on. When I spoke with representatives, I shared that by expanding the allowable uses of the food service funds, schools could utilize these dollars to purchase much needed lunchroom furniture without impacting the general fund, which also means it would not cost the state additional money. As such, I appreciate Senator Kunish hearing our concerns and proposing this bill. Representative Yuakim for supporting and bringing it to the House Education Finance Committee that will expand the allowable uses of the food service fund to include lunchroom furniture and express my support of this bill. Thank you for your time and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Fletcher. Um, so our next testifier is Jeremy Schmidt, who's the superintendent of Becker's Public Schools. Please state your name for the record. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Jeremy Schmidt. I'm the superintendent of Becker Public Schools. I am, uh, I'm here today testifying on behalf of MSBA and the schools that utilize the school food service fund uh, to support our feeding our students. I wanna thank you for your previous work uh, in the legislature, uh, providing free meals to our students and, and lunches and breakfasts. Uh, I come at a little bit different angle. I'm, I'm asking for this uh, bill uh, to be used to help us create more efficiencies and uh, more welcoming environment within our, our school cafeterias. At Becker Public Schools, we have seen an increase 
um, going off of 2016 to 19 numbers, pre-pandemic numbers of lunch service. Uh, we've seen an increase of 15% more lunches served in our K-2 primary school, 17% more in our three through five intermediate school, 23% in our middle school of sixth through eighth grade, and 21% in our high school for an average of about 20% more lunches being served from compared to 2016 to 2019. Uh, if any of you, and I know some of you have been in lunchrooms uh, when they're taking place uh, and, and feeding, they're, they're getting five, six, seven hundred kids through lunch lines in about an hour and a half, two hours of time. Uh, now that number has just increased by 20%. And so we need to be able to utilize food service funds to help improve the efficiency in, in our lunch rooms and in our kitchen food service areas. And I, that's what I'm asking for today in, in support of House File 5326. Uh, I, I do agree with uh, Ms. Fletcher and Chair Yuakim as well uh, in, in using it for, for lunch tables and, and things, but we don't even have room to put lunch tables in, additional lunch tables in our, in our cafeterias and as well as the serving areas. I'd hope that you can include renovations, remodeling as well as those lunch tables in there using language such as uh, the school district may allocate funds from the food service fund for renovations and modernization of serving areas and lunchrooms to improve efficiency, safety, and the overall dining experience for students with pre-approval from MDE, which we currently have to receive. Uh, by modernizing these facilities, we can streamline our operations, accommodate growing student meal numbers, and create environments conducive to healthy eating habits and social interaction. In conclusion, I again ask for your support of House File 5326, recognizing its potential to revolutionize our food, food service programs and over enhance the overall eating and educational experience for our students. I want to thank you for this uh, opportunity and uh, I can answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony, Superintendent Schmidt. Um, we have no members of the public that signed up to testify today. Um, are there any questions at the table? <laughs> yeah. Chair Pryor. Thank you. and I. Just uh, appreciate the testimony that we've heard, and especially as you take us back to lunchrooms. <clears throat> and I'm talking to my granddaughter that's in middle school <laughs> about <laughs> lunchroom dynamics and how you can only have so many people at the same table, except if they're your friends, then you have to pack the table. And um, so I know that actually what we're talking about is just so important to our students right now and their well-being um, for that um, that meal time that they have. So um, we we uh, we greatly appreciate the testimony they were hearing about this and. Um, Greatly appreciate uh, having the bill brought forward to make sure that we doing everything we can for um, this new new journey that we're on of universal school meals and how essential that it has been to our kids. Thank you, Terry Yuki. Representative Reem. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Chair Yuki. Um, so I would like to um, echo what the superintendent from Becker Public Schools said. I know when I met with the superintendent at Eastern Carver County Schools, they talked about um, how they really appreciated uh, the universal school program. A lot of kids were eating the meals, um, really loved the program, but they were lacking space for making um, the food with the additional number of students who were taking advantage of the programs. It, it was really hard for them to, I guess, make the food. So I think it's a great idea to expand this so that the schools can, you know, improve the kitchen space and add tables and make it easier for kids not only to eat the food but also for the uh, food service workers to be able to make the food. So um, I appreciate the comments and this is a great bill. Thank you. Thank you. Lead Krisha. Am I at the end? Yep. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Chair Yuakim, for bringing this forward. Always appreciate flexibility. I'm just wondering if the two superintendents could come back up. I just have two quick questions, financial questions. Uh, so Superintendent Fletcher and Superintendent Schmidt, could you come forward, please? And then when you get down here, state your name for the record. Madam Chair, Jeremy Schmidt, Becker Superintendent. And Mandy Fletcher, Superintendent of Blue Earth Area Schools. And Lead Krisha. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to both of you, uh, Mr. Schmidt and um, 
or Ms. Schmidt and Mr. Uh, Fletcher. Ms. Fletcher, Mr. Schmidt. I want to make sure I got these right. Just I easier to do, Superintendent. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, just uh, financially, you had met, I'm just curious what your fund balances were before, and you had mentioned two and a half times. What actual dollars? What are the fund balances at now versus what they were? Superintendent Fletcher. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, so um, historically over the last um, 10 or 15 years or so, our food service on we're a school district with about 1,050 students currently. And in our food service fund, we've had anywhere from 200 to 300,000, which has been fairly healthy. Um, this was pre-pandemic. Since then, we are currently about $650,000 which is in excess of six months of our operating expenses for that fund. Superintendent Schmidt, do you have a comment? Yes, Madam Chair, Representative Kresha. Uh, Becker Public Schools has about 2,900 students and we have about $2.5 million of how much we spend per year in food service and we have about $750,000 in that account at this time. Thank you. Lead Kresha, follow up. Yep, and uh, so to the Becker superintendent, is that 750000 surplus? So you, uh, I just want to make sure I get that, it right. That's our Eight. fund balance as of- I'm sorry, uh, Superintendent Schmidt. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, that is our fund balance as of June 30th of last year. It was $750,000. Okay. Lead Krisha. Okay, thank you very much. That's all I want to know. Okay, great. Seeing no further comments. Um, Chair Joachim, do you have any following um, Final comments for your bill. Thank you, members, for the good questions. And we'll also be reaching out to the school nutritionists to talk to them about this, as well as finding out what the interactions are with the federal money going into the account. So um, I want to thank Chair Clarity and members for your time and attention and questions. Um, with the success of Universal Meals, our districts have been looking at ways to increase the capacity of their lunchrooms. This bill is a place to start by providing them with a little flexibility. We can revisit the issue of surpluses in their school food service accounts again next session. I think that'll be important for, for us to do once we get another year under our belt with the Universal Meals. And with that, I renew my motion that House File 5326 be laid over for possible inclusion in an education finance bill. Wonderful. And so with that, the chair lays over um, House File 5326 for possible inclusion in the Education Finance Bill. And I'll hand the gavel back over to Chair you account team for the final comments. We're going to give you a little time to get over to the Capitol today and get some time back in your calendar. I can drag it out. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I was just going to thank you for actually meeting with me yesterday to kind of walk through what's um, potentially going to be in the bill. And members, I just want to remind folks that we don't meet this Wednesday or Thursday, that next week will be 1 o'clock, uh, room 200 on Monday, uh, 1 to 2.30, Tuesday, a regular time and regular room for testimony. And uh, our CA, Sir Fennec, will put out some email invitations mm -hmm. and also let folks know when they can sign up for testimony. And then Wednesday we will have amendments and voted out. And we are still working on the best amendment deadline for our nonpartisan research so they're not working over the, around the clock, which they probably are from here until uh, the end of session. <laughs> we want to make it a little less painful if we can. So we'll let everybody know about that as soon as we know. And with that, members, we are adjourned. Oh, Madam Chair, I'm oh, sorry. Sorry. That's, and just uh, offline conversation. So just so I get the timeline then. So we're going to meet on Monday. Um, when when do you think you would like to have the the amendment deadline? What I, here's my question is to help nonpartisan staff. Are we going to keep the 24-hour rule, which is fine? And then when would be an ideal amendment deadline so we can work with you and nonpartisan? We don't need to be crazy about amendments. Just want to know what for a timeline. Um, yes. So since we have the, we'll have the bill posted um, by Sunday, yep. uh, early or early afternoon. Um, so we'll have the walkthrough and the testimony. So that'll be two days for you guys to look at it. So we're looking at early evening on Tuesday night. Early evening amendment mm -hmm. deadline Tuesday night, and then the 24-hour rule uh, applies. Correct. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Now, with that, we are adjourned.